thing um, and then we'll head on over to the main the main speakers of the night. So I'm going to share my screen with you guys. Um, and okay, we'll do it from that way. And presentation show, um, slideshow. Here we go. I can't believe we're almost three um, three years into our climate campaigns. Isn't that bizarre? Anyway, just to let you know, guys, that we will be recording and publishing um, the climate cafe recordings. So if you don't want to be seen or you don't want to be uh, listened to, as it were, outside here, then please just keep yourself mute and your camera off and you can still communicate through the chat. Um, we won't publish the chat, um, but some people might save it in individually. Just, just be aware of that. Um, so all microphones will be muted during the presentation except for the speaker and the chair and um, you can ask you can use the chat for clarification at any point though any point in time so if if you're hearing somebody speak and you, and you just need um to know a bit, a bit more then please do use the chat and we will be able to satisfy your your kind of query at that point um but no questions because we'll do that afterwards so if you ask a question too early it'll get lost um so also we ask you to be mindful and respectful of all involved in the cafe um, we are a very friendly cafe. Um, so to ask a question, this will come at the end and Jeff will go over at the time as well. Um, you pop an asterisk in the chat, state which the speakers you're directing a question to, it can be all, um, give a quick kind of summary of your question and then wait until you're asked by Jeff um, to say your question. If you don't want to say your question yourself, then Jeff is quite happy to ask to say your question for you. But just put that into um just put that into the actual chat yourself and then we'll be able to do that okay um obviously when you're asking a question unmute yourself and then once you've asked the question just mute yourself so we don't get lots of background um noise okay so that's all clear for the moment as i say if you have any questions then please do pop it in the chat um today's cafe is really exciting plant-based diet and alternative land use so i wanted to do this for quite a while um almost feels like we should have had it in january but maybe that's just too on trend um who's speaking well first up is rachel martin who's going to speak about everyday veganism in family life followed by rebecca knowles oh sorry rebecca this is an old one here it's not vegan outreach it's actually um farmers for stock free farming um and she's going to talk about greenhouse great gas emissions and the plant-based diet and repurposing agricultural land. Um, yes, sorry, I'm annoyed at myself now, Rebecca, because I changed it on the Facebook and I took it from the event, right? Never mind. And then last but not least, Claire is going to be talking about Bonobo, which is our fantastic plant-based cafe here in town. And then once all those lovely speakers have spoken, then we're going to have a Q&A session um, up until nine o'clock. Um, and... And that'll be it basically so that's tonight there's lots of other things there's a lot going on at the moment um next tuesday at 7 30 we have got one planet prosperity where terry O'Hearn, the um sleeper ceo is speaking about sleeper's vision or his vision for a one planet prosperity so do come along you um we'll have him speak for half an hour and then there's half an hour for um questions after that as well um some of you might be aware, um, but if you're unaware, we are trying to create in the Northeast a, a climate community, climate uh, action communities network. Um, and we're going to be doing an event on Tuesday, the 22nd of September. It's in kind of midst of getting planned at the moment. Um, but if you are interested, if you're part of an organization and want to, to join, then please do let me know. You can pop it in the, um, in the chat. Um, or we will be putting details up on the Facebook page and social media so you can get in contact with us, with us then. Um, our next sustainable, our next climate cafe, I should say, is sustainable fashion and that's on the first Tuesday of October, Tuesday the 6th. And then our climate cafe in November is Innovations in Marine Energy. Um, I would also like to say that we do pop a lot of events from other organisations um, on our Facebook page, so please do look at that as well. Um, and hopefully you'll be able to find out all that you need to know. 
But now all I've got to say is here is our media. So you can take a, a little screenshot of this if you want and you know where to find all the information about ourselves. And then I'm going to leave it now and let um, Rachel start talking. So Rachel, it's over to you. Hello, good evening, everybody. Thank you very much, Alison. I'm delighted to be here. Let me share my screen. As Alison introduced, I'm going to be talking about veganism in family life. So can I just confirm that you can see a sort of a, an aqua colored screen? Great. <laughs> okay. This is my family. So that's, I'm the tall one and my husband's the shorty. And then we've also got two children, Daniel, who is 13 and Elizabeth, who's 10. So this was actually taken about a year ago at Glen Cove, in fact. <clears throat> now, I've been vegan for nearly 20 years. I still can't believe it sometimes. It was early 2000s, so I don't remember the exact date, maybe 2002, 2003. So it's not quite 20 years, but I'm getting there. And I went vegan pretty much overnight because of these two guys. These were my dogs, my pet dogs at the time, That's Zeke on the left and Freud, as in Sigmund Freud on the right. And I just loved them to bits so much. They were like my children. It was before I had kids. So these were my kids. And one day I saw on the internet this photo and it's a photo of dogs being taken to a market in Asia to be eaten. And I was really horrified, angry, upset. I felt a bit judgmental actually that they were eating dogs. And I thought I could never eat my own dogs, but I can't really judge them when I'm eating pigs. So it was like just a light bulb moment overnight, vegan. And I guess you could say my reason is was very much an animal rights, animal welfare reason. But since then, the, the sort of so many other reasons that have, have confirmed my decision from environmental reasons, uh, climate change, land use, and um, um, health. Sorry, <laughs> I just had a vague moment there. So um, that, that was the turning point, but there's just been so many things over the years uh, to, to convince me further of this. And what do I actually eat? I think there's a tendency for people, especially when they go vegetarian for the first time, to be a bit confused about what, what to eat. And a lot of people give up meat and then just replace it with cheese and pasta, which isn't really a healthy way to go about it. I think this is really the answer, legumes. So these are things like chickpeas, lentils, beans, beans of all kinds. If you can fill your diet with these, not even, even if you're a meat eater, I think you can't go wrong with foods from this group for good health. And here's a, just a selection of some of my favorites with legumes. So on the very left, burritos. Uh, then the second one, a good old lentil dal. And lentil dals are just so easy to make. You can use red lentils. There's no soaking required and you can have it made in about half an hour. Then there's falafel, so that's chickpeas. And then on the right is a good old chili. So just a small selection of everyday foods that are very easy to have as vegan items. Now, veganism is really, um, there's some great foods from all over the world. And, and in fact, many cultures have a predominantly plant-based diet anyway. So if I think about Thai and, and Japanese food, they have very little dairy, traditionally no dairy at all. It's, it's Westerners that have introduced dairy to these diets. And, and meat eating was consumed in very small amounts. Um, this picture here is of pad thai, which is one of my favorite dishes. It would traditionally have some egg and fish sauce in it, but it's very easy to make without those things if you want it vegan. In fact, Wagamama do a vegan version of pad thai, which is delicious, so I can recommend it. Um, <clears throat> having been vegan for nearly 20 years, I have amassed an enormous collection of cookbooks. Um, but I will tell you a couple of my favorites. These two I find I cook from all the time. Isa Does It, it's just a massive book full of every kind of recipe you could possibly imagine. And some quite interesting ones too. Some things, unusual combinations that you might not have thought of. And then the book on the right, the How Not to Die cookbook, 
uh, is quite a new one. And I, we really love this. In fact, the kids love recipes from this. And it also seems to work because I haven't died yet. So this I can definitely rec recommend, um, especially if you want to focus on veganism for health. The How Not to Die cookbook would be the one I'd go for. This one's also good. The picture on the left is Brussels sprouts. And I'm showing this because the kids, my kids anyway, love it. And Brussels sprouts aren't usually something children like, but this dish is really good. It's got tamarind sauce on it, so it has a really nice tangy flavor. And the book is great because you don't have to sit standing by the stove stirring. You can literally just bun everything in a dish, chuck it in the oven and leave it. So it's a kind of a nice lazy way to cook. There's also this book, the Scottish Vegan Cookbook. And you don't usually think of Scottish food as being very good for vegans, but this book is full of every type of Scottish, traditional Scottish dish you can imagine made in a vegan way. And they're really good. I've been so impressed with every one I've made. This photograph is of the leek and tadley soup, and it's made with cannellini beans. So there's no dairy in it. The beans give it a really rich, creamy flavor and that you can just sort of see there on the plate are bannocks. These are, um, there's a recipe for bannocks in there as well. So a type of bread, Scottish bread that you can dip in the soup and it's delicious. So cafes and restaurants, we're pretty small city Aberdeen, but I think we're spoilt for choice for thing, places we can go. So there's food story. I do wanna say it's not fully vegan. You can get some vegetarian things there. I know they serve dairy in coffee and I think there are some salads but most of the main meals are vegan and they're absolutely delicious so this is my son um, having just cleaned up his plate at Food Story one night um, a year or two ago I can't remember when exactly um, and then there's Bonobo which is our only fully 100% vegan cafe which I think you'll hear a bit more about later and this is really great because you can go into Bonobo and you don't have to look at ingredients. You can order anything you want and you just know it's going to be vegan. So there's something quite reassuring about that. And I've got a photo of Bonobo as well. This, I, this is quite old. Um, just when it first opened, I took this photo. Um, and they've been a lot, as well as Food Story, been delivering during lockdown. So that's something new. You never were able to get food from Bonobo or food story delivered to your home, but you can now. And I can really vouch for the scones from the Nobo Cafe. <laughs> they are so good. Now, just because you're vegan, it doesn't mean you have to miss out on junk food. We also have Roots Catering in Aberdeen. And they, they, these guys run a van by the beach. They've also been delivering during lockdown. And if you want a disgustingly delicious and unhealthy burger, then I recommend this. That's one of the burgers that I ordered one night. Right, dessert. So we don't miss out on dessert either. Just because you're vegan doesn't mean you don't get to have all the sugary, fatty stuff. Now this um, is a Victoria sponge, which the recipe came from the Dirty Vegan book by Matt Pritchard. And it's quite hard to find a vegan Victoria sponge recipe because you sort of need the egg to make it really light and fluffy. But his recipe is great and that's my attempt at it. And I just thought it was quite funny because you've got this tough guy with tats and muscles and here he is with this Victoria sponge recipe and it was kind of um, a strange contrast. Really good, good recipe book though too. And this is just a chocolate cake of mine, which we love making a lot. It's, I put um, ground almonds in it and this gives it a really nice texture. So I, I make the chocolate cake just as I would any other uh, with just as I would with all the regular ingredients, but I've ground up a heap of almonds and included that in it as well. So that is a good way to sneak nuts into a food, which brings me to the next topic, children. How, what do you do about children? Um, I should say that technically speaking, I'm the only vegan person in my household, but because I do the cooking, everyone is vegan in our household. We don't have any meat. I do not cook separate meals for them, the children or my husband. I don't think that's a good path to go down. If you start cooking your own meal and then another meal for everyone else, it's just too much work. It's not sustainable. And 
they can eat the same as you. There's no reason why kids can't eat vegan as well. But if we go out somewhere, I will let them choose what they want. So they do sometimes when we eat out, they will order something with meat. But at home, we are always vegan. And they're fine with that. There are no complaints about it at all. They're pretty happy um, to eat that way. But they are still fussy. Um, and kids are quite contrary. I think that it, often if you try to push something, they'll resist it even more. <laughs> so I've got a few strategies you can use for kids. One is marketing. So just at a very, as a very basic, oh, I've gone the wrong way. As a very basic example, um, we invented something called apple chips when they were little, which is just apple cut into slices, but it's called apple chips. Uh, so it makes it sound yummy. Um, so that's your marketing. Another is, um, it's kind of weird that kids don't like nuts. I mean, how can anyone not like nuts? They're just delicious. And I could never get them even to try nuts. They just refused. But I discovered I could get something really unhealthy, honey roasted cashews full of sugar and salt, and they scoff them down. So then the next step is you get them to try the nuts, then you get the nuts that are just salted, no sugar, then they, they, they're onto those, and then you get just the plain raw nuts. So that's another technique you can use. And that works, believe it or not. Um, disguise. This is the fail safe way to get um, kids to eat something they don't want to, is to disguise it. This is broccoli soup. It's basically just broccoli. <laughs> Unfortunately, my kids like broccoli, but I know a lot of kids object to vegetables. Um, but you can just mix everything in, moolly it up so that it's indistinguishable from what it was before and they will eat it. So this is a great way to get them to eat nuts. This soup has cashews in it and cashews are terrific because any recipe you have that calls for cream or milk, you can just use cashews. If you grind them up in a coffee grinder or a nut grinder and mix it with water, it becomes a really nice creamy paste. Um, so I use ground up cashews in lots of things. This soup is one and it's terrific. Milk, milk's another thing. So when I went vegan about 20 years ago, there was really only soya milk. That was the only choice. Nowadays, there's so much at the supermarket. Soya, oat, almond, cashew, hemp, coconut. I mean, this isn't even all of them. There's more than this. And I've included a photo here of two oat milks just because they're both made in Britain. I know that's a concern, especially if you're environmentally aware. Oat milk is very sustainable and you can get it from a British company. I don't think they source it 100% from British grown oats. It's, I think I did, I don't quote me on that. I'd, I'd want to check with them. I checked once with Provider Mill. I think they try to but we perhaps don't have enough, so they supplement a bit from European oats. But nevertheless, they're British companies, and we grow plenty of oats in Scotland. I really think this is a market we should be cornering oat milk. And um, I should point out, my husband wasn't vegan when I, 20 years ago, when we first met, um, and it took him a long time to give up dairy. But just in the last few years, he's fully switched over to oat milk. He never liked soy milk, but oat milk, he finds quite palatable. And I think that's a much easier switch for many people who might find the soy milk tricky. Oat milk's very easy. Um, yeah, and it's delicious. I love soy milk. I'm so, that's the other thing. Tastes change. So you might try oat milk in your tea one day and think, oh, that's gross because it, it tastes different to what you're used to having. But drink it for a month and you'll prefer it. That's, that's really how it is. The nice thing about plant milk is you can make your own. So you can't really do that with a cow. Um, I mean, you can't really do that with dairy milk unless you get a cow and put it in your backyard, but who's gonna do that? With oat milk, you can just, sorry, with any plant-based milk, you can make your own. And it's a little bit messy if you're just using stuff you have at home, like a bit of cloth to, because you have to strain it through to get all the bits out. But on the right is um, some almond milk I made. At the beginning of lockdown, I bought five kilograms of almonds and it lasted with me the whole time. <laughs> I was just making almond milk. And it just, it was quite reassuring to know that even if all the shops had sold out, we'd have milk for the next few months. They don't go off. You can store them for months and months and months, unlike dairy, which you have to buy every couple of days or it goes sour. So 
nuts have a lot of advantages, I think, in that way. And oat milk too. I could never master, you can make oat milk, but I could never quite master it, but just had trouble with that. Um, another cool thing is you can put your own calcium powder in it. And I did that with my almond milk. You can just buy this online and put in a couple of teaspoons and you can have fortified plant-based milk that has the same amount of calcium as your store-bought cow's milk. So no problem at all. Okay, so let's talk about vitamins because I often get asked questions about what vitamin supplements you need to take as a vegan. And there are three things I think vegans need to be wary of. These are calcium, iodine, and B12. And I don't want you to look at this and think, oh God, this, this is things I have to worry about. Because if we apply the same rule to omnivores, they have seven things they have to worry about. So we've only got three. And um, I think that's miles better. And, and these can, B12 and iodine, um, you can all get from a tablet that's produced by the Vegan Society. This contains iodine and B12. It's also got vitamin D, which the British government actually recommends everybody in the UK take a vitamin D supplement, not just vegans or vegetarians. It's something that we're often deficient in here because um, there's less sunlight. But B12 deserves a bit of a mention because it can be very serious if you are deficient in B12. Very much an important vitamin to watch out for. If you're buying store-bought plant-based milks, almost all of them are fortified with B12. So it's not an issue. But if you're making your own, it's probably something you'll want to look into. And you can, in fact, buy liquid B12 and add it to your homemade milk if you're doing that. When I first went vegan, people used to say to me, um, oh, well, if you have to take a B12 supplement, then that means we should be eating meat, right? Um, and no, I don't, I don't think that's true. It's true that you have to eat. Um, it's true that you cannot get B12 from a plant source. It's actually made by bacteria that live in the gut of ruminants. But animals are given this supplement as well. So our cows and sheep are given B12 supplements. So if you take the supplement yourself, you're just bypassing that animal. They are often also deficient. And if you search for livestock B12 supplement, you'll see there are lots of brands available for livestock. Um, another one I want to mention is omega-3. And this is a bit like B12. People always say, oh, but you have to eat fish. That's the only way you can get it. But actually fish don't make omega-3. They get it from algae. So vegans can get it from algae too. And this is a, a tablet I, I like to take called Nothing Fishy, but there are quite a few brands out there. So they're not paying me to recommend them or anything. <laughs> um, pets. So as you know, I had those dogs many years ago um, and often people become vegan and this is a bit of a concern for them. They're vegan, but they're buying meat for their pets. And what do they do? So believe it or not, there are some vegan pet foods. There are quite a few different products on the market. This is just one that I happen to know is made in the UK called Benevo, and they do dog and cat food. I think there's a bit of, um, there's a bit of debate about the cat food because um, cats are obligate carnivores. And I've actually just find myself in a position as of a month ago, we now actually have a pet cat ourselves after seven years without any pets, we, we ha now have a kitten. And they don't make kitten food, so I haven't been able to buy this. But I've been wondering what we would do. Um, there's also another option for pets, and that's not strictly vegan, but definitely better for the planet, and that's insect-based food. This company, Yora, make a dog food that is made using the larvae of flies. So they're sort of grub-type creatures. And it's much more um, sustainable, as I said, not vegan. So some people might find that a bit uncomfortable. I personally am okay with eating insects. Um, so I would feed it to pets, but they don't make a cat food. They, um, I contacted the company and they said they're working on one maybe around Christmas that will be ready, but that's your own. So there are options. There's vegan pet food. There's also insect-based pet food. Travel. We're really lucky in the UK. There is so much vegan and vegetarian food 
wherever you go. It's so rare to go to a restaurant and not have something vegan. And even if there is, you can always ask and they'll make you something special. I've never had any problems in the UK. But traveling in other places, Southeast Asia, no, Southeast Asia is fantastic. But in Europe, believe it or not, it's quite tricky. I went on a work trip a couple of years ago to Madrid and we went out into a village outside the main city for lunch and they had nothing at all, <laughs> not a single thing. So I asked for something vegan and they found it quite difficult to understand what a meal without meat was. And I wanted to say, I can eat plants, any plant. There are actually more than 20,000 species of edible plants on the planet. It's a huge amount of choice. If you think about giving up meat, you're maybe giving up four species, sheep, lamb, cows, chickens, pigs, right? Maybe five. But if, you, if you're eating plants, you've got just an abundance of choice. They gave me this for lunch, a plate of artichokes, burnt, I might add. <laughs> and yeah, I was pretty, they didn't even taste very nice. I was pretty horrified, but that happens in Europe even now. So be wary of that research ahead, find out where the vegan places are and um, you should be fine. Um, and then lastly, um, people might be wondering about, well, if I become vegan, what's that going to do to me physically? Am I still going to be strong or fast or um, can, I, can I be an athlete? And I just wanted to point you to a film that came out last year called The Game Changers. It's really inspiring. It's a vegan documentary, but it focuses on elite athletes. So athletes who are top of their game, the best of the best. And it's all kinds of athletes from cyclists to long distance runners to bodybuilders. Um, and just talks, goes through and, and shows all their examples. So I'm not saying that, well, actually here's one of the, the characters from it. This is Nimai. Delgado, he's a, a bodybuilder and he's in the film. And I'm not saying if you go vegan, you'll look like that, because, well, I don't look like that. Um, that would be nice. But <laughs> going vegan doesn't mean that you can't still weight lift or be athletic. I go running every day and cycling. I'm, I'm in my mid 40s now and I've, I've never felt as, as alive and physically healthy in my life as I do now. So it's definitely not something that you need to worry about. You can be vegan and healthy, you can be vegan and unhealthy. It's about eating the right foods. Um, so yes, that's all. If you want to, uh, I think you can ask questions at the very end after the three talks. But if you wanted to get in touch with me later, I've got a blog, rach.blog, and that's my Twitter handle, Rachel M. Squirrel. I will stop and hand over to Alison. I hand it back. Thank you, Rachel. That was really interesting. Um, I enjoyed that. I think it's always useful to to really hear from somebody who does it on an everyday basis. All those kind of practical things. Um, <laughs> my, I think I think uh, my son would go vegan if actually he liked any vegetables. Um, that <laughs> that's quite a difficulty. So I'm still working on that one. 